I'm going to get the recording started. Officially, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emily Voss, and I'm the We the People coordinator for the state of Virginia. Welcome to you, Unit 3 for the We the People National Finals. Uh, in just a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves. They'll then ask you to introduce yourselves and your coach. And then y'all are very familiar with how things go from there. Uh, they will read out the question. You'll read your prepared statement. They'll do follow-up questions and feedback at the end. Um, I'll also serve as your timekeeper. So just you know, look out for me doing one of these <laughs> at the appropriate time. I will stay on mute, so I will not cut you off if you happen to be in the middle of a sentence when I hold up time. It is perfectly fine for you to go ahead and finish your thought. Okay, so with that, I will go ahead and hand things to your judges. Um, good afternoon, students. Uh, you may know me. I'm uh, Donald Rogers from Central Connecticut State University. Uh, and we have lovely weather up here today. So it's real testimony to you that you're inside, you know, uh, you know, uh, devoting yourself to uh, discussion of the US Constitution. And we've all we've had a tough year, right? So it's a tribute to you again that you've uh, made it all the way through uh, to get ready uh, for this competition. So I, I uh, the Donald Rogers at Central Connecticut State University, uh, where I taught history before I retired. You know, I've been involved with the We the People for many years, and it's a great program. And you're, you've got a great teacher to work with, uh, and look forward to hearing your cover, your your presentation. Kv, we. We've been with y'all so many times. Apparently, it's us that can't get it right. Y'all have got it down. You just keep bringing us back so you can do some remedial teaching with us, I guess. But we need it, so we're glad of it. And we're glad to be getting led today by uh, by somebody who can speak Connecticut. Dr. Rogers can definitely do that, so he'll keep us moving along. I'm Mike Miles from Birmingham, Alabama, and I've enjoyed watching your team before. I've seen some of you on the screen before, but Katie, it's nice to be with your class again, what a tribute to you they are. We're glad to see them. And uh, my name is uh, Joe Stewart. I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in uh, South Carolina. Donald has been uh, pointing out to both Mike and me uh, all day what good weather you have in Connecticut. And Mike and I are trying to stay above water uh, down here in the Southeast. So. Uh, but I am happy to be with you today. Relax. We're going to have fun learning from you about the Constitution. So let's go have fun. Please introduce yourselves. Good afternoon, judges. We are Unit 3. Our unit focuses on how the Constitution has been changed to further the ideals in our Declaration of Independence. My name is Rachel, and in the fall, I will be studying biology at Fordham University. Hello, judges. My name is Sai, and I'll be studying math at the University of California, Berkeley. My name is Lauren, and I'll be studying psychology at Penn State University. Hello, I'm Rohit, and I'll be studying economics at Duke University. But for now, we are all seniors at Trumbull High School, and this is our teacher, Ms. Boland. We thank you for being here today. Good to see you all. Great. So um, we're going to um, start the, the weekend off with you um, talking about question number one. And uh, for the purpose of the recording and to remind us all of the questions about, I'll read you the question. Starts out with a quotation, as you know, quote, I do not think the United States would come to an end if we lost our power to declare an act of Congress void. I do think the union would be imperiled if we uh, could not make that declaration as the laws of the several states, unquote. What impact has judicial, judicial review had on federalism? Is judicial review a counter-majoritarian practice? Please support your position. What limits, if any, would you place on the practice of judicial review? Please go ahead. One of the Federalists' most important goals of the Constitutional Convention was to forge a strong set of federally enforceable rights against abusive state governments, a goal dramatized by the Catalog of Rights in Article I, Section 10, the Federalist forebear of the 14th Amendment. These concerns stood in a stark contrast to the beliefs of the Anti-Federalists, which centered around limited state governments, limited central governments, sorry, in recognition of the distinct character, history, and laws of the sovereign colonies. History proved the Federalists right. We agree with Justice Holmes. The federal judiciary's ability to declare a state law as void is fundamental to the protection of liberty enshrined in the Constitution. Justice Holmes's opinion was shaped by the horrors he witnessed as one of the few officers of the Massachusetts Cavalry to survive the Battle of Gettysburg. 
he understood that what the framers had laid out in Article 1 was insufficient, that the 14th Amendment and its prefatory language, no state shall, would usher in a new and necessary paradigm in the battle over federalism in our Constitution. Since that Reconstruction, judicial review has been the tool that has steadfastly protected the rights of all citizens, and in many cases, even non-citizens. Using the doctrine of selective incorporation, the Bill of Rights has become a bulwark of rights against all government conduct. By applying many of the rights in the Bill of Rights as against states, more than a century of Supreme Court jurisprudence has pushed the fight for civil liberties and individual rights forward. For example, in the 1925 case, Gitlow versus New York, the court struck down a state law that punished advocating the overthrow of a government by force. In Gideon versus Wainwright, the court overturned a Florida law that stated a lawyer could only be appointed to a defendant in capital cases. In Brown versus Board of Education, the court invalidated state segregation laws that violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In Tibbs versus Indiana, the court declared that the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause is an incorporated protection applicable to the states in 2019. To be clear, in each of these cases, the Supreme Court struck down a law that was validly passed by a duly elected state legislator. In other words, in the context of invalidating state laws, there's no question on the matter. Judicial review is inherently a counter-majoritarian process, as it is contrary to the majority will as expressed by representative institutions. And while the idea of nine unelected justices having the power to overturn the sovereign will of the people may be discomforting for some, it is precisely what is necessary. In recent years, many have accused the court of usurping the powers of Congress and thus exploiting this counter-majoritarian practice. In cases such as Bush versus Gore, Citizens United versus FEC, and Obergefell versus Hodges, the court has ruled in a manner that many on both sides of the political spectrum see as inappropriate legislating from the bench. Although Congress has the ability to change the size of the court and impeach judges, we believe that placing true limits on judicial review is almost impossible. Judicial activism is inevitable. Because of the difficulty of the amendment process and the polarization in Congress, judicial review offers a slightly more efficient way of making change. We propose that the Supreme Court should only declare a statute as void if two thirds or more of the justices concur. A series of 5-4 decisions along partisan and ideological lines has undermined the public's trust in the court. A supermajority rule would help reverse this trend by restoring an expectation of bipartisanship and a norm of consensus. The latest Biden commission offers a good opportunity to look deeply into what really needs fixing in the Supreme Court. There is no single answer, but allowing for these supermajority decisions is certainly a step in the right direction. Thank you. We are now ready for your questions. Thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Um, I noticed that your discussion of the uh, Supreme Court action against state legislation starts uh, in the 20th century with the Gidlow case. Uh, did the Supreme Court not strike down, contain uh, state le uh, legislation before then, uh, even before the Civil War? Well, I would say that the court before Gitlow, it did focus a lot on federal uh, cases and federal um, actions. Uh, when we look into when we look to the beginning, even with Marbury versus Madison, the court declared um, a, stat a federal statute as unconstitutional. And even before Marbury versus Madison, state courts and um, courts in the states actually used judicial review to strike down certain uh, state uh, laws that were um, unconstitutional uh, per the state constitution or certain other laws that um, discriminate against uh, some of our fundamental rights. And the reason we discussed Gitlow versus New York specifically is that it was the first time there was selective incorporation of the Bill of Rights onto the states, which is imperative to make sure that states' laws don't invalidate the Bill of Rights. And so that's why we mentioned that case specifically. But as Rohit has been saying, it has been going on for years. But now we have the first, second, fourth, sixth, and eighth um, Bill of Rights incorporated. And hopefully all of those will be incorporated in the future. Very good. But the question is, what happens before the 14th Amendment and before incorporation? Well, before the 14th Amendment, the court wasn't necessarily able to incorporate these rights. And after the 14th Amendment allowed for the court to be a little bit more powerful in that they were able to incorporate some of the fundamental rights that were not only explicit, such as 
um, the right, uh, the, such as freedom of speech, but also some of the rights that are implied, such as privacy, which is implied in the Fourth Amendment, as we see in Griswold versus Connecticut. Yeah, but with that, some may argue that the Supreme Court has been given too much power by allowing um, incorporation of the Bill of Rights into states and other issues. And as Rohit said, being able to interpret the Constitution into broader terms, many believe that the main purpose of the Supreme Court has been diminished. As Justice Roberts states in his dissent, this court is not a legislature. It says what the law is, but not what it should be. The job of the Supreme Court should be to strictly interpret the Constitution and nothing more. I think it's also important to note that right after the 14th Amendment was passed, it wasn't really effective because the court ruled in the slaughterhouse cases that um, the privileges and immunities clause that was in the 14th Amendment was based on a national privileges and immunities rather than a state pri privileges and immunities. So the court pretty much ruled that our federal government can't step in on those issues. So, so it wasn't necessarily the 14th Amendment that gave the court more power. It's the court's um, interpretation that went on um, as generations passed that led the court to have this power. Professor Stewart. Or what changed then after, because you're right, I mean, we get from slaughterhouse to get low. What, how did the court make it there? Well, um, so actually the writer of the 14th Amendment intended for the 14th Amendment to be on a broader scale as it is today. But um, right in the beginning of when the 14th Amendment was passed, people thought that it was just for newly freed slaves and that it couldn't be um, interpreted to fit everyone in the United States. So I think that um, as time has gone on, we've looked to our federal government for um, kind of the way to protect our rights and liberties that are in the constitution. And this is when the court started to be able to strike down laws as unconstitutional in order to benefit um, our individual liberties of both the minority and majority in the constitution. And I think it's also important to note that the court's ideals and values have changed over time. When we look at the Lochner court, which was a very conservative court that dealt with a lot of states' rights, um, we see that the court has ruled um, more in favor of states and protecting those rights. But as we do move forward into the future, such as the Warren court, the Warren court was a much more progressive court in that it um, ruled not only based on states' rights, but also individual liberties. However, as Sai previously, as Sai previously argued, um, basically a lot of people think that the Supreme Court has developed too much power. And as Hamilton actually said in Federalist 78, the people authorize the Supreme Court to pass neither force nor will, but merely judgment. So as Sai was saying before, it can be dangerous that the court has developed so much power, especially in recent history, and especially with the passage of the 14th Amendment. Mr. Miles, you're muted. You're muted. I was so locked in on what you were saying, I forgot to unmute. Are there some equal protection implications, though, in what you're saying? If the Supreme Court keeps bouncing all these things back to the state, and in Alabama, if you get 45% of the vote, you can go to the Senate. But if Georgia, you don't get 50%, there's a runoff. And in Connecticut, uh, you can mail in your ballot if you want to. But in Alabama, the legislature shortens the runoff to a point where you don't have time to mail in a ballot. But the Constitution promises me equal protection under the law. If you're voting in Connecticut and I'm voting in Alabama in a federal election and the restrictions are different, has the Constitution and the court failed in giving me equal protection under the law? And if it hadn't, why hadn't it? I would say that it definitely has. And we can look at the court case Shelby County County versus Holder as a great example of this, where, um, where um, the court ruled that section four of the Voting Rights Act um, that required preclearance from the states to change their voting laws as void and um, out of date. But I think in order to preserve these voting rights that we do have an inherent right to in our constitution, we have to overturn the Shelby County versus Holder decision in order to guarantee everyone equal, equal protection to their right to vote. Yeah, adding on to Lauren, however, I believe that this should be done through a constitutional amendment. It is our job as the people of the United States, when we want a right, we have the ability to um, fight for it through an amendment, uh, 
constitutional amendment. And I would propose that we um, follow House Joint Resolution 75 of the House of um, Representatives, which would create the right to vote a national amendment and it would make the processes of voting constant across the whole country. This would ensure that everyone, regardless of their state, has the same access to voting and can vote in the same way. And while my colleague side makes a great point, it could be very difficult to pass an amendment. As Justice Antonin Scalia said, a population the size of Rhode Island can essentially overturn an amendment. So I think something else could be done with a congressional act. A great example of this is the Help America Vote Act of 2002, where it essentially regulated things nationwide. I think another act very similar to that, that regulates the way we vote and voting equipment could also be imperative to making sure that we all have equal protection. Thank you. Just for the record, what's the Lochner case about? Lochner um, versus New York, what's it about? So Lochner versus New York was a conservative, a more conservative um, court that decided that min uh, minimum wage and the minimum hours for working could not be enforced because we have a freedom of contract in the constitution, implied in the constitution, but um, this was considered um, Act in a judicial activism case, um, even though it was conservative because um, the freedom of contract isn't necessarily written in the constitution. Okay, thank you. Sure. Well, a very um, um, a substantive and passionate uh, presentation uh, from all of you. You, you all pitched in uh, with, uh, with uh, some interesting points, um, um, especially uh, in the 14th Amendment era beginning in the 20th century, you uh, provide a very documented uh, discussion uh, of the uh, uh, Supreme Court's uh, intervention to strike down both state uh, and federal laws. Um, I was disappointed, however, that you couldn't say what happened in the early 19th century. And uh, I mean, that the uh, Supreme Court was uh, considering state laws and was striking them down, but on a different basis than the 14th Amendment. And just remember a famous case like McCulloch versus Maryland. I mean, uh, that that's, you know, we, uh, implements the uh, Article 6, Section 2, uh, or the Commerce Clause in Givens versus Ogden, so, and Contract Clause cases. So, so, so there's a lot going on there. And so it isn't just with the 14th Amendment, although you're right, uh, Slaughterhouse was sort of a slow start. The Supreme Court adopted a very narrow interpretation. So even before Slaughterhouse, I mean, the Supreme Court is, is acting, and you, you, you could have uh, brought that um, uh, into your discussion. But for the modern stuff, I thought you, you had a lot of really good things to say. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I got two or three comments. Uh, when you, I was I was thrilled to hear you mention Slaughterhouse. And and yeah, that's that's what uh, that that's what the initial imp, uh, impediment that the court puts up in uh, in enforcing the 14th Amendment. So where do we go next? Well, we wind up going to the due process clause. And so that becomes the mechanism that's used in Gitlo all the way up through Thames. So that, that would have been a good opportunity to, to talk about that. Uh, I wish we'd had time to talk about the, your argument about undermining uh, public trust, that you're saying that a bunch of the close decisions undermine public trust. Um, I would have asked you to wrestle with the fact that people just don't have a clue of what the decisions are or what the Supreme Court is for that matter. Uh, a, a week after the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act or the Obamacare, depending on whether you like it or don't like it, there was 44% of the population didn't realize the Supreme Court had made a ruling on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, over half the population in 2010 didn't have a clue who the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is. So one of the problems that we have, I mean, I, it, at some level, you're correct. Public trust is important, but there's a public ignorance out there that we have to overcome also. The final point I would make is something you said right at the end where you talked about, um, uh, well, if this was, uh, uh, Lochner was an activist decision, even though it was a conservative court. Don't conflate 
activism with ideology. There are conservative activists, there are liberal constrainists, and vice versa. Uh, and if you if you don't like the precedent, you're you're looking for activism to overturn that, regardless of which way it goes. So be careful. A lot of people make that mistake, but the good news is I'm confident that with the level of, of knowledge you've demonstrated, uh, you won't make some of the, uh, the same mistakes I've seen other people make in, in general, uh, general discussion. So thank you very much for your efforts. You've done a good job. <laughs> Public ignorance, he said, if you, Dr. Joe is so reluctant to say what he really thinks about things or how he feels about people's abilities. You have to really read between the lines to see what he thinks about things like that. That's why I enjoy talking to him. Dr. Roger said something that struck me. He talked about the passion that you had in delivering this. That's a word we haven't really heard used much today. You not only had passion in delivering it to us, but you sounded like you believed it, which is a whole and different views that you strongly believe those views. And that goes a long way with us. Katie, if you're keeping, I mean, uh, well, let me say this to Emily. Emily and Joe Stewart and I have a thing going today about how many times Alabama and Shelby Beholder are mentioned to the guy from Alabama. And Emily, when, when Lauren said that, Joe and I held up seven fingers. I don't know if you could see us, but we both held up that seven, <laughs> yeah. seven out of 10 units today. And Lauren, I want to give you credit for that. You made sure to include, include me in my state <laughs> in the critique of where they screw up. Uh, Joe says that any real mistake in, in voting rights emanates at some point from either Alabama or Texas. And I think he's probably right about that. Last thing I want to say, just for fun, I, I said, to the other Connecticut class earlier that uh, in Alabama, we're smart enough not to send our women's basketball team up to play Geno and, and, the, and the, the UConn Lady Husky uh, for good reason. Well, what you just showed me right now was we probably don't want to send our We The People teams up there to take y'all on because y'all are just as good as the basketball team and that's a compliment. And so, um, it was fun to watch you perform today. It was great. Katie, I know you're proud of them, and you should be. You should be. Dr. Dr. Rogers. Thank you, students. You did a great job. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor. Um,